Welcome to the podcast covering section 1.19, which is about water and how important it is to life. Uh, you'll see in the bottom here I have a wonderful picture of either water or a sea serpent. I will leave that one up to you to decide. Now one of the key things about water that's interesting is that water is pretty much the largest thing that comprises life. So when we look at life, we think of organic compounds, you know, these carbon-based compounds that are produced by life. But we also really have to think about water because the majority of all living things is water. If you dry out most living things, uh, it's going to take where the vast majority of the mass that they possessed was water. You know, they're going to shrink dramatically, just like if you take a steak and shrink it down to essentially jerky, you're going to have a very small amount that you get. You know, that one pound might become four ounces. And so this idea of water is going to be critical for biologists to trying to look for life. This is why when we go to other planets like Mars and we start browsing around, we're looking for organic compounds, certainly, but we're also just looking for water, especially liquid water, because that's the most easily used by life, at least as we know it. If life is different from what we know, then we really can't study it too much because we can't even imagine it. But as far as if we have life that's similar to what's on Earth, water is one of those key pieces that we can look for to see if it's possible on another planet such as Mars. That's why it's such a big deal when they talk about there being uh, water available in the Martian soil. They're saying that there's kind of this chance that either now or perhaps sometime in the past that there was life on Mars that's somewhat similar to what we have here at least. And now on top of that, now that we've kind of said how important water is, the other idea is that a lot of water is not going to be usable by all organisms. Uh, when we look at the Earth, you've got the Earth is 70-some percent water. But almost all of that water, 97 percent, is salt water. Now, most of that's oceans, where some organisms can live, but terrestrial organisms, freshwater organisms, we can't drink or live in salt water. It would kill us. This is why you can't go drink seawater. Not only would it taste horrible, uh, possibly make you throw up, it would eventually kill you if you kept drinking it. We'll cover that later when we get into cells. Uh, but there's also going to be some areas that are so salty that even fish and things like that won't be able to live in them. So a lot of this water, at least from a human standpoint, is kind of a no-go. You know, it's not going to fly. And so there's only this 3% that's fresh water that we're kind of talking about when we really look at water from a terrestrial organism standpoint or the standpoint of a freshwater fish, crustacean, insect, whatever. Now, of that 3%, over two-thirds of it is going to be stuck in ice. So we can basically say this 3% now gets kind of taken away and becomes 1%. So 1% of the fresh water, 1% of the, the total water, uh, is ultimately going to be accessible to us in some way. Now, the vast majority of that 1%, almost all of it, as you can see here, there's very little that's going to be the other or the surface water. So the vast majority of this is going to be groundwater. So this is why so much of our water comes from drilling wells and ultimately pulling water out of the ground where it's drained and gathered. Uh, very little water is actually sitting in lakes and ponds and streams and rivers and all those things that are just kind of sitting around. Very little. So to meet our demands, we're almost always going to be digging down and accessing this groundwater because that's our single biggest source. That's where this 1% of all water that we are generally going to use is going to be found, going to be uh, accessed. Uh, you're not going to get very much water at all if all you do is try to look at just regular bodies of water that are hanging around. That's not going to be a good strategy. It's, just, it's very little. So it lets you realize just how in demand fresh water is and why there are places like in the Middle East, parts of Africa, even parts of the U.S. where they're very drought prone and you can see how big a deal fresh water is. Uh, you can see how badly people need it because everybody needs to have access to some, to some water to meet our needs just to live. And so it's not one of those things that you can just be like, oops, whatever, uh, we all need some. And then as we talk about the structure of water, we're first going to look at just a single, a single molecule of water, which is going to be an oxygen and two hydrogens. And these are going to be bonded together by a covalent or sharing bond. Now the trick with this covalent or sharing bond is that they don't share equally. This is not like the nice good kid, this is the kid that does not play well with others. So while it does share, it tends to share more like 90% of the electron goes to oxygen, 10% goes to hydrogen. 
So this is a, a, a sharing where you're like, you do, you have, we have this dollar, so to speak, that we're sharing, but 90 cents of it's going to one guy, 10 cents is going to the other. So this unequal sharing means that the oxygen molecule is going to become slightly or partially negative. And the, oct the hydrogen parts of this are going to become slightly positive. It's not a full positive, but it is definitely a partial positive. It's enough to attract other negatives. You know, the partial negative is enough to attract other things that are partially or completely positive. And so this polarity is going to be huge because water is very polar. And so because of this unequal charge distribution, because there's this kind of positive and negative end, negative oxygen, positive hydrogen, so positive, negative. So because of this, if you get it near other water molecules, you'll see that the negative part of one water molecule will be kind of attracted to the positive part of a separate water molecule. And they will form hydrogen bonds together, which will be those weaker bonds. They're more easily broken, but it still will help separate molecules of water kind of stick together. And this will be important as we get to the next slide. Uh, it also allows things that are charged. So in this case, we have salt, NaCl. Uh, it allows things that are ionic, because the Na is plus charged, the Cl is minus charged. So anything that's polar or ionic will like to dissolve and mix with water. So it makes water a very good solvent, which means that things like to dissolve into it. And we call those things that dissolve into water solutes. So in this case, salt would be our solute. When you make Kool-Aid, sugar is your solute. And as long as it's not nonpolar, like our lipids, fats and oils don't mix with water, it's because they're nonpolar. But the vast majority of things are either polar or ionic. And because they will also have these partial or complete charges, they'll gladly kind of intermingle with the waters and kind of split up as they intermingle. And so it allows us to dissolve stuff. And so that's why we oftentimes call water the universal solvent. Because this idea that opposites attract will allow the negative chlorine in this case to be attracted to the hydrogens of waters. And it'll allow the positive sodium in this case to be attracted to the negatives. And so we can get where they kind of meet their, I don't want to say needs, but their stability needs, we could say, of being around oppositely, oppositely charged things. But they can do that with water. And this is very useful because we're mostly water, our blood is mostly water, so we can dissolve things into our blood, into the liquid that's in our bodies, and move it around. So it's kind of a cool thing to have. It is useful. Now, for other properties of water, all of which will come back to water being polar, and we'll all come back to the idea of those hydrogen bonds that allow water to grab onto other molecules of stuff, you'll see it's sticky. And so this would be like if you take a drop of water, the fact that it forms a drop is because of something called cohesion, which is where water will stick to water. And so this is what we drew on the other page, where the water was hydrogen bonding to another water, and so it helped the water stick together. That's why water wants to form a drop in the first place, because those water molecules want to huddle together, if you will, and stick, and so they can form this sphere. Now, if that drop of water is on the end of your finger, or the wall, or a pen, that's going to be something called adhesion. Uh, and adhesion is going to be when water sticks to something different. So this is where water sticking, in this case, to your skin. It could be the metal on a faucet. It could be the paint on the wall. But this is where water can stick to anything that's not nonpolar through the same hydrogen bonding and allow it to kind of cling. And so that's why a drop of water, if it's small enough, can cling to the wall and stay put. If it gets enough mass, the hydrogen bonds are weak, so they will break, and it'll roll down. Uh, but if it's a small enough drop, it can just kind of sit there, stuck to something, whether it's the sink, your finger, the wall, or anything else that you have that's not nonpolar. Uh, this is also cool because you get an effect called capillarity. And this is what plants use, where they've got these thin tubes, and the water will stick to itself, and the water will stick ultimately to the sides of the tube, and that allows it to draw water up kind of like a straw. And so this requires pretty much no energy. Uh, the water just evaporates from the top and pulls the rest of the stuff up, just like we use a straw. And so this is how trees can get water up long distances. This is also why if you have a cup, you can actually overfill the cup. You can get kind of like a little bit of a, a muffin top, if you will, on the top of the glass. Make sure if you test this out, feel free to. Just make sure it's somewhere that won't get destroyed if it gets a little bit wet, if you go too far. This is also why you can put stuff like paper towel in a container of water, and the paper towel can actually have water climb up it against gravity. 
because it's kind of grabbing hold of these particles and each other and so it can kind of pull itself up using these hydrogen bonds that it's forming and so it can essentially fight gravity as long as it's got enough stuff nearby if, if the water forms too big of a drop once again it falls but if you keep things on a very small level water can do some cool things because it can stick to stuff it's also going to resist change specifically in temperature and this is a big deal because we don't walk outside when it's 40 degrees out even if you're in shorts and suddenly you're dead you know it's not like your body temperature suddenly plummets because water slowly changes temperature if you take your hand and put it on a burner it's gonna burn quickly but if you put a big pot of water and you set it down in a burner and put your hand in there it's gonna take quite a while to heat up that container of water to get hot enough to harm you this is also why if you're along a coastline like Seattle or England it tends to be pretty mild year-round because all that water when it gets really hot will absorb heat to kinda of cool it off and release heat if it gets cold so you don't get huge temperature extremes if you're on a coastline whereas if you come inland and you're around someplace more like Ohio or the extremes of Texas and Kansas and Oklahoma it can get to be well below zero when it's the winter and it might get over a hundred in the summer you get these big swings because water isn't there to kind of buffer things so water is excellent for all life because it resists temperature change and you might see that called high specific heat is the fancy term for this and that just means it takes a lot of heat to make water change its temperature so high specific heat the high boiling point we'll talk more about this later but this just helps make sure that water is a liquid if water was a gas it'd be hard to access if water is ice it's once again hard to access whereas liquid it's pretty easy for us to ingest to use water to move it around so it's kind of just important that we have that water is very balanced where it has a relatively low freezing point and a relatively high boiling point so it fits the temperature range we have here pretty perfectly and then ice floats and this is because ice is ultimately less dense than water now this is abnormal for most solids solids usually have particles closer together so they sink but in ice these hydrogen bonds if you're talking about a molecule of water when you're liquid you're moving around a lot so imagine if you held hands with the people around you but then you all started running you'd end up kind of wrapping your arms around yourself and they'd end up close to you even though they're holding onto somebody else they're not outstretched so in water the actual molecules get closer but if you form ice and you slow down it's easier to kind of stretch out and so if you stretch your arms out if you stretch out those bonds it increases the distance and so that means you take up more volume with the same mass you're less dense now this once again might seem stupid but if you have a pond and you form ice and it sinks then ultimately the the whole pond will freeze solid and everything in it will die in the winter but as it is now that doesn't happen instead what happens is you get this insulative layer of ice that prevents the bottom from freezing so inside of this you can have fish and you can have like I don't know a drop but like little snails and crustaceans and whatever else still living under the ice that's why you can go ice fishing because you didn't kill everything in there because the ice ultimately protected the rest of the stuff thankfully because it floated and the other cool thing about water uh, in general when it changes from one state of matter to the other is when you go from water to ice you tend to form additional hydrogen bonds and when you form bonds you release heat so this is cool and this is why a lot of times if you grow crops you can water them if it's gonna get really cold because that way the water might freeze but then it'll insulate and provide heat for the plant so the plant hopefully won't freeze and it'll survive they do this a lot in southern states uh, if they have crops and it happens to get cold which it usually doesn't they can spray them down with water to try to get them through that frost to try to not lose their crop and so it doesn't always work but as long as it's not too severe of a cold this can work uh, you can also just submerge stuff in water in general if you're trying to maintain its temperature because if the water you submerged it in which resists temperature change anyway but if it does start to freeze it can help insulate and protect the rest of it from freezing so part of the big container of water might freeze but whatever you have in there and some of the water that's in there hopefully won't unless it's really cold and then you're just screwed and then if water goes from a liquid to a gas it's going to absorb heat so this is why we sweat because as the liquid that we've sweated goes off and evaporates it takes heat from our body it absorbs it as to let it become a vapor and go 
and this is because it's breaking these hydrogen bonds that are holding it together and when you break bonds we talked about that's activation energy it takes energy this is also why when you get out of shower it feels so cold because you have water on you the water is going to start evaporating taking heat from you so your skin's going to feel cold so this is useful for just regulating our temperature if you get too hot have your water become a vapor cools you down if you get too cold as the water becomes ice it'll warm you up a bit hopefully enough to keep you alive and then lastly life is going to be typically somewhere around 70 to 90 some percent water we've said before that we are a whole bunch of water but this is critical because a lot of our chemical reactions these biochemical reactions in our body require water or they'll use water and so we need to make sure that water's around or else we can't do these chemical reactions. And if we can't do them, we can't do the things needed for life, like maintain homeostasis, get energy, and you die. So this is why life as we know it has to have water. So what I've done here is give you two equations that involve water, so two reactions that involve water in our bodies. The first one will be called photosynthesis. And so this occurs in some bacteria, in algae, like seaweed, and in plants and so this will take carbon dioxide water there's our water and energy which will be provided in the form of light and it's going to use those to kind of package it all together to build up and it's going to produce in this case we're going to use the sample of glucose and then it has an, a byproduct which will be oxygen gas so this is what we as humans and animals breathe to allow us to do the other process which we need to make energy called cell respiration so down here we've got cellular respiration this is not breathing this is the process where we break down our food to generate ATP which is the molecule that we need so that we can provide energy for the rest of our body so that we can live and so we're gonna see here that we're gonna take some molecule that's organic in this case we're gonna use glucose guess where we got it from you're right we got it from photosynthesis so in this case if you're a plant you're just going to use the glucose that you made because plants are going to do both of these processes they'll do photosynthesis and cell respiration if you're an animal you're going to kind of steal the glucose from a plant that did it making photosynthesis and you're going to plug that in here so you eat and then you'll break it down and we're going to need oxygen so we also are going to get that from these helpful little plants and algae and bacteria and then we're going to break them down into carbon dioxide and water and we'll get some energy along the way which will be ATP the guy we talked about that allows our body to do all those endothermic reactions we need to essentially to get work done to provide us with energy now the end results here are CO2 and water which if you pay close attention can go along back here to the plants the algae the bacteria and they can use them to do photosynthesis so there is kind of this circle where for plants they just do both of these processes so it's, it's a cycle within them but within animals because they tend to do more photosynthesis than cell respiration because they're building stuff that they're not going to eat you know they're building structures their cell walls the stems the leaves they're not going to ingest those things and so we can eat those structures that they intended just like we have meat and bones we meant them to be there so that we can grow so that we're bigger so that we have structure but something can eat those things just like we eat plants and take the energy that was stored there break it down so we can make ATP so we can live so even animals still depend upon these guys but once again animals and things that are going to ingest their food we call them heterotrophs they're gonna only do this process whereas autotrophs guys that make their own food they'll typically do both of these processes when I say typically there are some ways of making your own food that are not photosynthesis but all organisms will do cell respiration so this one's gonna be done by everybody most guys that make their own food will use this one so if you make your own food if you're an autotroph this will be used almost always but not always there are some other kind of odd ways with some weird bacteria and such that can do this so at this point we've covered the characteristics of water the chemical structure of water why it's important and some of the reactions this will be an intro into later cell stuff uh, with photosynthesis and cell respiration and how we use water to keep ourselves alive so I hope you guys enjoyed it and have a good evening.